All right, we're already into Chapter 6, Module 6, Law Enforcement Contact with African Americans. Now let me give you a little bit about my background, uh, not that I'm saying I know a whole lot about African Americans, uh, but I was born and raised in Oakland, California. For those who don't know Oakland, California, it's a very diverse area. There's, time I was raised there, it was back in the 60s and 70s, it was probably uh, 60 to 70 percent African American, uh, probably 30 percent or so uh, Caucasian, uh, a lot of Asian, Asian Pacific Islanders like we discussed last module. Not a whole lot of Hispanics, very very few, uh, as that was Oakland back in the 60s and 70s. So I was raised in a pretty diverse uh, neighborhood, um, but I only say that so it shows I have a little bit of perspective of what I, how I saw my friends treated, uh, and many of my friends were, were blacks, African Americans. We'll talk about the different terms in a few minutes here. So our learning objectives for this uh, module, uh, you should be able to describe the historical background of African Americans as it relates to, to uh, the interaction between citizens and police. And that historical background has a whole lot to do with the way uh, some of the race relationships are, are uh, seen. We'll describe some key aspects of uh, diversity within the communities themselves, including uh, different classes and cultures and religions. We'll explain the evolution of the African American identity movements in self-identification terms. We'll talk about some stereotypes and cross-racial per perceptions. And we'll talk about some characteristics of African American uh, families, uh, gender roles, single mothers, and youth as they relate to law enforcement contacts. And we'll talk about some misperceptions of what happens uh, in, in African American neighborhoods. And we'll discuss some key issues associated with law enforcement contact of African American communities. So those are our learning objectives, seven of them for this, this chapter. A little bit of historical uh, background. The, the blacks, African Americans, were the only uh, migrants that were forced to come to America against their own will. Uh, the majority of them, now there were a, a number of African Americans that, that did immigrate before the slave trade started, but uh, the slave trade started pretty early in our history, American history, and most of them were kidnapped. They were victims of, of crimes. They were kidnapped from their families in, in West Africa mainly and brought to the Americas. Not only the United States, they were brought to the Caribbean, to South America, and they were enslaved. Uh, slave labor, cheap labor, they weren't considered to be human beings, they were considered to be inferior beings by the, by the people back then. That's the only way they could justify uh, treating another human being the way they treated them, is that they justified their minds by saying that these people were, were not uh, full human beings. Um, as we know, that's, that's completely incorrect. Um, even the government, the United States government, you know, used to only count uh, blacks as three-fifths of a person during a census. Uh, you may have heard that term, three-fifths of a person. They weren't even considered a full person during the census taking. And the only reason they call them three-fifths of a person is because the uh, uh, South wanted to get tax money uh, for their population of, of African-American slaves they had down there. And unless they counted them, they didn't get any tax money from the federal government. And so a lot of the racist ideas uh, that were came out of the slavery uh, still persists today. You think about it, we're only 150 years out of out of slavery. Slavery was in, in existence for 400 years. Uh, and so 400 years and then 150 years we're, we're out of the slavery movement and a lot of people will say that not much has changed in the last 150 years. Uh, it's changed but you know that we'll talk about some of the things that haven't changed. Um, this author, Patton, talks about how that many of the uh, stuff that happens in our communities today come from history. Uh, and it can be direct, directly traced back to the Civil War and the Reconstruction and the way people were treated even after uh, the 13th Amendment uh, was passed and ended slavery. If you guys have not seen the movie Lincoln, uh, Daniel, uh, starring uh, Daniel Day O'Connor, I think, uh, recent movie just a couple of years ago. Go see it. It's a great movie. He talks about passing the 13th Amendment and uh, what, what, what it took to do that and all the political things behind it. Very, very good. I, I learned a lot about the 13th Amendment. Um, but during the Reconstruction era, the police and the military uh, 
were required. That was your job, was to do slave patrols and to return runaway slaves to their, uh, to their owners. Um, they had slave patrols, uh, segregation laws, Jim Crow laws. You may have heard of those laws, the difference, uh, you know, separate but equal. They had restrooms. One was, was, was uh, labeled colored, the other was labeled white. And those were laws on the books that were enforced by the police. That's a whole separate discussion we have in AJ100 about enforcing laws that you don't feel are correct. We have that whole discussion in AJ100, so if you haven't taken that yet, uh, if you have, great. If you haven't, you know, take it and we'll talk about it there. Um, when, when African Americans and other people that were being oppressed uh, decided they'd had enough, they started protesting. And this was during the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, and those protests were broken up by the police department because they were declared to be illegal. Uh, mainly Caucasian white uh, police officers uh, breaking up the demonstrations. Uh, you can go to YouTube and see tons of videos on that kind of stuff. Uh, some uh, blacks were in social economic class that was lower than, than the whites, and that uh, gave some one-sided perspective of African Americans. Uh, population demographics today, as you see on the slide here, 13% of the population is uh, African American. Um, and there was a, a shift back in the 40s and 50s, uh, actually started way back in the 20s and 30s actually, where um, they called it white flight, where the uh, white folks started moving out to the suburbs. Uh, if you want to look at LA County, they moved from uh, from downtown LA out to out to the coast or up to the you know Santa Clarita Valley or Simi Valley, uh, Ventura area up in there. But the long the the truth of it is is there's blacks that represent all socioeconomic classes from the lower class all the way up to the, some of the richest uh, richest people in California. Uh, you look at Magic Johnson here in, in uh, the L.A. area, very, very rich, uh, higher economic class, uh, self-made man. Um, and, you know, on the other end, there's just people that are criminals that are living on the streets. Uh, they happen with all colors. And society uh, as a whole still, there's a uh, discrimination. Uh, and I should have started off by saying a lot of, a lot of my students here in the class are black. Uh, the area we teach in, El Camino College, South Central Los Angeles, is a, a largely black and Hispanic area. So a lot of you, are, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, you know uh, what's going on. You've, you've been a, a victim of some of the police misconduct we're going to discuss later on. Uh, again, as like I said, the majority of the group came from Africa to the United States, but also there was immigration from Jamaica, Trinidad, Belize, uh, Haiti. Oh, by the way, I was in Belize a few years back, actually, last year, earlier this year. I was in Belize, and I had an El Camino t-shirt on, and the, one of the guys in the dock there, one of the dock workers came up to me and said, Hey, I went to El Camino College. I lived in with my uncle in uh, Torrance and took a couple classes over at El Camino College, so I thought it was pretty cool. We're known worldwide. Anyway, in Puerto Rico. Uh, there are regional differences uh, in the way um, African Americans are treated. Uh, in the different regions of the United States, uh, and especially in the concentrations. We'll talk about the migration. If you read the book, it talks a lot about the migration. Um, you know, the, mainly in the South, uh, people were brought there to be slaves, working on the plantations in the South. In the North, uh, they were mainly free, um, in the, especially in the East, Northeast. Uh, people migrated here to the West Coast for opportunity, especially during the World War. During the World War, there's a lot of the military-industrial complex out here, so a lot of the uh, the African Americans from the South came out here to, for jobs uh, in the Bay Area, up in Richmond, uh, Oakland, that area there. A lot of shipbuilding going on uh, down here in the South Bay. A lot of uh, the industrial war complex building planes and stuff like that. So a lot of people migrated out here for the jobs. A little bit about the religious background. Uh, a lot of, for a lot of African Americans, church is a big part of their life. Uh, majority of African Americans, if you read the book, it says I think 86 percent are Protestant. Uh, that's the uh, Christian religion. That's non-Catholic. Uh, a little history on on the. Uh, if you don't know the history behind pro Protestant, it means protest. It was a Martin Luther uh, movement back when he was protesting against the Catholic Church. But anyway. Um, Many are Baptist, 
uh, the first African American churches in the United States were, were Baptist churches. Uh, and some are Muslim, uh, Nation of Islam Muslims or the American Muslim Mission. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about those religions other than what I've read. I've actually uh, known people that were Nation of Islam, and there's a lot of famous people that were Nation of Islam. However, I don't know have a, a whole lot of knowledge about those other than what I've read and read in the book. All right, uh, the fastest growing uh, black population churches are the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. But there are other religions, especially the Caribbean uh, religions like Santeria, which is a very interesting religion, a lot of rituals. Uh, it's a real similar to Catholicism with, uh, with different rituals. Along in the 60s and 70s, uh, the Black Pride movement uh, started a whole new direction. You remember in the civil rights we talked about earlier in the late 50s and early 60s, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Martin Luther King, uh, Rosa Parks, and the civil rights leaders uh, started their protests. And the race relations moved in a different direction in the 60s and 70s. It also opened up a lot more opportunities in education, employment, politics, affirmative action came along, which, uh, which uh, allowed access to employment and education. Uh, and then also African culture and heritage were researched uh, and studied more during that time. Well, people were going back to their uh, quote-unquote roots. Maybe you've seen the, uh, the movie Roots, the, the miniseries Roots, that was a book by Alex Haley. Uh, prominent African-American man, and uh, Alex Haley wrote the book called Roots, and it was a quasi-history uh, of his family. Uh, terms changed. Uh, people were called colored people after the, uh, the uh, Civil War, uh, and then they started to be called Negroes back in the 60s, and then the word blacks uh, replace the word Negro and then African Americans and, uh, as you go into the 90s uh, more African Americans now not all blacks want to be called African Americans matter of fact most most people I know that are black you know <laughs> race is not really the issue that they, they don't want to you know if they need to identify with a race then, then that's what they do but you know um, they, they don't you know it shouldn't be a, a racial issue Some myths and stereotypes. Uh, some of the myths are the uh, disproportionate number of crimes in black neighborhoods. Uh, there are crimes in black neighborhoods. Uh, there are crimes in white neighborhoods. Um, high crime rate among black males. Uh, there is a crime rate among black males, but there's also a crime among, uh, among white males. And we'll talk about some of the different misperceptions here in just a minute. And uh, blacks often get stopped for not looking like they belong to the neighborhood. Uh, for those of you in, in the uh, class here, or my classes, that are African American, I'm sure you've probably run into that. Uh, I, I hear the stories over and over again. I lived those stories growing up in Oakland. Like I said, if I was hanging out with a, with a group of white friends, we very seldom were uh, sitting on the curb with our hands in the air. Uh, but if I was hanging around the mixed crowd, blacks and whites, uh, we were often uh, uh, asked to get out of the car, uh, what we're doing there, what we're up to. Um, I've even had police officers pull me aside and ask me why I was hanging around black kids. This is back in the 60s and 70s. You know, that's that's the way it was back then. Um, pretty bad. So are blacks, males, and white males viewed in equal terms? Looks at some terms here. So if a white male is confident, sometimes I'll say the black male is arrogant, displaying the same attitude. Uh, if a white male displays a self-assured attitude, some people will say that the black male has got a chip on their shoulder. Um, if the white male is viewed as assertive, some folks will say that the black male is aggressive. <coughs> white male can be viewed as a natural leader, whereas blacks, uh, you know, could be the dominant personality. Uh, I've often heard this term, you know, he's just a wayward young man. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's just a wayward young man. He'll, he'll find his way someday. Uh, if it's a black male, sometimes I'll say it's violence prone. You know, that's the way they are, violence prone. Uh, white male can be viewed as smart, whereas a 
black males say, oh, uh, some people say black males are naturally gifted. So there is, they're not viewed in equal terms. Uh, sexual experimentation can be viewed in the black community as prowess or sexual predators. How about perception of officers? Police action. Blacks stopped in white neighborhoods. What's the black perception? DWB is PC. Driving while black is probable cause for stop. That's the perception. Uh, and it shouldn't be the case. Uh, use of force or, or added charges, stack charges on blacks uh, are viewed as officers or racists. You know, every group has racists, and, and there are officers out there that are racists, and we'll discuss that more in a little bit here. The code of silence or the thin blue line, that's where officers protect each other by not uh, not uh, speaking up when something's wrong. Um, if you had my AJ100 class, we talked a lot about the thin blue line and how it shouldn't exist. Uh, it does, and I've done everything I can to not make it exist. Uh, in my people that work for me, remember I was a commander when I, when I left. And some blacks view that as an us against them mentality. In other words, they have to stick together because the police aren't going to be protecting them. Let's talk about the black family. A lot of strong family ties, especially cross generational ties uh, in black families. Um, and when we get to the Hispanic families, we see a lot of that also. Also, the Asian families. You remember, we talked about the Asian families, uh, you know, multi generations living in the same house. Extended families, very, very valued. Uh, for the most part in this this community um, now some people there's a myth that the black family is matriarchal which means that uh, the woman runs the family that's not necessarily the case it's just the fact that that uh, uh, the black women will speak out more often than say an Asian woman would and so um, in in most studies and most academic studies and in, in most experiences you have the, the male still is the dominant member or at least an equal member in the family. I don't want to sound sexist to my uh, my females in the class here, but it's um, it is what it is. You know, sometimes the the men are the more dominant in the family uh, or at least equals. Um, <clears throat> uh, black single mothers get a lot of attention from the police because a lot of times outsiders are critical the way they think uh, that the person is. They think that, you know, maybe they're a slut or something like that and they just got knocked up and some people don't realize that that single mother, some single mothers make that choice to uh, to have a, a child and raise a child. That's the choice they made and they do a mighty fine job at it. Um, often they're stereotyped, you know, welfare, there's another welfare mother or something like that. Uh, again, I've seen that actually in the black officers say the same thing, you know, well, there's another welfare mother um, talking about a black single mother, uh, less respect than they should be getting from the officers. You need to make the extra effort. Uh, I, I may have talked about this at the beginning, but I'll definitely talk about it at the end. You need to treat everybody as a human being. Uh, it doesn't matter what what they're what happened to them in life. Uh, that was my philosophy. No matter who I talked to, no matter who I dealt with, I always treated them as a human being first. Uh, even if they were criminal, uh, and you got to put aside whatever their crime was, because um, you're not the judge, you're not the jury, you're simply there to make the peace, to keep the peace, uh, and if need be, uh, take somebody into custody. Uh, but if you took my AJ100 class, we talked a lot about discretion, and using your discretion is, is very important in this type of uh, environment. Um, seven to eleven year old boys are at high risk. Uh, boys really do need a, a male role model. Um, and sometimes if the father's not in the home, they look to other people for role models and a lot of those people are, are uh, not the best role models. Maybe they're older teens that are in trouble, maybe they're gang members. Uh, but hopefully there's somebody in the neighborhood that's a good role model. Um, it, my, my folks were divorced, but it wasn't until I was a mid-teenager, I was 15 years old at the time. Um, but I had scout masters that were role models. Uh, my dad was actually still a big part of my life, uh, even though my folks were divorced. Uh, but I also had my grandparents, and a lot of times the grandparents are, are the older male role models I see a lot, especially in African-American neighborhoods where the grandfather is the uh, 
is the dominant male in, in the household. Uh, officers often target this group uh, unnecessarily. Again, looking at discretion, um, there's a lot of different ways to handle uh, different crimes. If you took my AJ100 class or you study AJ100, we talked about discretion. You know, like the speed limit's 55 or 65 miles per hour. And if a person's doing 67, is that against the law? Yeah, it's against the law to do 67. Should I write a ticket to everybody doing 67? No. Same thing. You know, if, if, a, if a young male is out there uh, loitering when they're not supposed to be, or maybe they've got uh, cigarettes or something like that, you know, um, is there a time to use, use a warning and, you know, take them home to the folks and, and uh, mom or dad and uh, grandparents and see what they can do with them? Yeah, yeah, definitely use your discretion. Ebonics, uh, or the African American vernacular English, uh, its origins are from the West African tribes, also known as Ebonics. Uh, there's consistent grammatical rules in Ebonics, uh, and I got a short video I'll show in a second here, which is kind of a parody from the movie Airplane. It's really kind of silly. Uh, I'm not trying to make light of the, of the fact, but every every uh, every region and every every uh, race and every uh, ethnic background has their own different way of talking whether it be a completely different language like Spanish or or um, Tagalog or something like that <coughs> excuse me um, and Ebonics have consistent uh, grammatical rules and uh, one of the things is if you're not <laughs> a native uh, if you're not an African-American man or female for that matter, don't try to imitate Ebonics, you sound really silly, and that's just this video, I'll show, show somebody, and hopefully it plays right, comes up next here. Shit man, that hunk him up and mess my old lady, got to be running cold upside down his head, you know? Hey, hey home, I can dig it, no he ain't gonna lay no more big rap up on you man. I say hey Scott, Southern say I won't see him, uh -huh. pray to Jay I did the same old same old thing. Mac a self approach, slick. The gray matter back, lot performers down, not take TCB in, man. Hey, you know what they say. See a broad to get that booty act. <laughs> Lay it down or smack them, yak them. Cold got to be. You know? <laughs> Can I get you something? Some more folk put a lid into the bone. Check me up. Tight me. Sorry, I don't understand. Cuddy say he can't hang. Oh, Stewardess, I speak jive. Oh, good. He said that he's in great pain and wants to know if you can help him. All right. Would you tell him to just relax and I'll be back as soon as I can with some medicine? Just hang loose, blood. She's gonna catch up on the rebound on the medicine. What it is, big mama? My mama didn't raise no dummies. I duck a rap. Cut me some slack, Jeff. Yeah. Chump don't want to help. Chump don't get the help. Jive ass dude don't got no brains in there. Again, that was just a parody uh, to to show uh, some of the uh, way Ebonics is perceived. It just meant to be a little fun there. Clearly, that's not the way life really is. All right, let's get into some communication styles. You know, sometimes the standing cool pose, as they call it, uh, can be interpreted as, as uh, somebody being aloof. Uh, that's not it at all. It's just uh, the way some people act. You know, they, they want to be cool, they act cool. Uh, let them act the way they want to act. They're not being disrespectful. A lot of officers get that in their mind that people have to respect them. You know, respect is earned. It's not deserved. It's earned. You respect. You earn respect by respecting other people. You know, a lot of people talk about differential treatment. Uh, we'll talk about the incarceration rate in a few minutes here. But again, use your discretion. Uh, is, is an arrest warranted or would a warning make a, a better choice there we have a whole chapter on racial profiling later on in the, the uh, course here we'll talk about that in depth but does racial profiling happen yeah you bet it happens uh, it's not right it shouldn't happen 
and agencies shouldn't let it happen, but unfortunately it happens. Um, people have different reactions to authority, especially people in uniform, based on past experiences, based on what they've seen in the media, um, but mainly based, based on past experiences. Uh, and use of force, you know, police brutality, is it disproportionately used? Oh yeah. Um, you know, more use of force cases in, in uh, poorer neighborhoods than they are in, in nicer neighborhoods. Uh, some homicide trends. Uh, this is data from 76 to 2005. Um, the black population were disproportionately uh, homicide victims and homicide offenders. Um, you were more, six times more likely to be a, a victimization, victim of a crime if you were African American than if you were, were white. Um, and the offending rates for blacks were, uh, were about seven times higher than that for whites. Now, does that mean that, that blacks commit more crimes than whites? No, not at all. It just means that they're getting uh, arrested a lot more often. Uh, they're not given the breaks that uh, a lot of the white folks are getting. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. These are uh, Bureau of Justice prison statistics. So the number of men in prison per 100,000 pop, 100, population. I should, probably should have done this in reverse order, but for every 100,000 men in the population, uh, there are 477, uh, 4,777 black males in prison. Only 1,760 Hispanic males and only 727 white males per 100,000 population in prison. Uh, in my AJ100 class, in the chapters, we talk about incarceration. We talk about the reasons why that's disproportionate. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with social economic. Uh, some people can't afford a good lawyer. Uh, people, some people are more prone to, to uh, plead guilty. Uh, a lot of it is, as uh, we talk about, uh, the, the reasons why people commit crimes. A lot of it has to do with their upbringing and the neighborhoods they're in. Um, is that a good thing? Not at all. I mean, look at that. 4,000 more black males in, in a prison than, than white males per 100,000 population is, a, is not a good thing for our society. So what are the needs of the black African American uh, community? They want equal police services. Uh, everybody wants to be treated equal. Not separate, but equal, but equal. Um, they're very supportive of community policing efforts. I, I was um, on a community policing project up in Richmond, California, which is up in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, low what they call SES, social economic status area, uh, a lot of poor people, uh, a lot of crime in that area there. Um, but the, the citizens were very supportive of the police coming in and taking care of the, the people that were committing the crimes. Uh, they were very supportive of that. And how you lose support or by uh, by not treating everybody with respect, by treating everybody like they're criminals. Uh, and that's how you lose support. We had very good support up there because of the, the way we went in and the way we had met with the community and addressed their needs. And if you, uh, we'll talk more about community policing later in, this, in the, the uh, lesson here, not lesson, but later in the uh, course. But community policing is one of the best ways to, uh, to build up rapport with the neighborhood. Uh, Thankfully, there's more African American officers and police executives in law enforcement today. They have uh, organizations for police executives called Noble National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives uh, to promote uh, more African Americans uh, in the business. Um, a good friend of mine, Academy classmate uh, Warren Stanley, is the uh, number number three man and uh, number three person. <laughs> in the California Higher Patrol right now. He's got a pretty good chance of becoming our, our commissioner, African-American male. Um, you know, grew up in the Central Valley, went to school down here in LA. He didn't go to El Camino College, wish he did that, but he went to Cal State LA. But anyway, um, uh, and that's a good thing because again, we're becoming more reflective. We talked about that in chapter two, about becoming more reflective of the communities we serve. So heavy on recruiting. Um, you know, you need good leadership in police departments, uh, and the leadership needs to take on those officers that are doing the wrong thing. Uh, when I was a lieutenant, when I was a sergeant, and also when I was a lieutenant, uh, especially when I was in a watch commander role, uh, 
I made sure my officers did what they were supposed to do and if I ever got complaints I investigated them thoroughly um, and, and if somebody needed some correction that's, that happened I led by example I treat people with respect I had more people thanking me when I would arrest them or write them a ticket than I ever had getting mad at me for it because you got to treat them with respect hopefully some of you got a chance to watch the uh, video from the last module about communications uh, and the guy uh, Thompson with verbal judo really good video if you get a chance to watch it I know the summer session is kind of crammed together so summer session folks don't watch it maybe the fall and the spring so folks can watch it more you can watch it later on so recap of our learning outcomes we described the historical background of African American uh, Americans as it relates to interactions with the police we described some key aspects of diversity within the community uh, including culture and religion uh, we talked about the evolution of the uh, African American identity movements, the civil rights movements in self-identification terms. Uh, we talked about some of the stereotypes and how that they, they're no, usually wrong. And uh, we talked about the extended families, gender roles, single mothers, and youth as they uh, apply to law enforcement contacts. We also talked about some of the misperception of the characteristics uh, uh, verbal and nonverbal communications like the the cool stance I talked about and we discussed some key issues associated with law enforcement contact with African American communities so that's my verbal lecture whole 31 minutes 35 seconds of it for this uh, module there will be a discussion board questions some assessment questions uh, this is one of the longer modules in reading in the books one of the longer chapters but I think it's one of the more important chapters in the book um, finish reading if you hadn't done it and get to the rest of the, uh, the homework there. Thanks a lot.